Welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning, and this is my son Ben, and today we have the entry whiskey tasting. Yeah, the beginner's whiskey, I think we called it on the website. So yeah, Merry Christmas and today... Happy holiday season. <laughs> Happy holiday season. <laughs> and today we're gonna have four beginner's whiskies. And at the beginning, if you do have the whiskies at home, which we unfortunately don't sell into the international market, so probably not many of you have that, uh, keep some still water with the whiskies. You can enjoy other whiskies if you have some at home. So, but these are quite widely available. Mm -hmm. So most of them should be available worldwide mm -hmm. with the Tulibardin. I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But the rest should be available worldwide. Yes. And at the beginning, for all of you beginners out, out there, uh, I would like to start off with uh, whiskey all around the world. So where does whiskey come from? We have the big cross, the white cross on the blue background. That's the Scottish flag. Yeah, that's the scotch. And scotch is for the premium whiskey, the biggest producer in the world. So Scotland makes the most whiskey. And um, it is being followed by the Americans on the new continent here on the left. Uh, we have two like main um, regions. states, regions where mm -hmm. they produce whiskey. The biggest is the blue one, the blue background with a white dot on it and there's a, a, an old pioneer with this musket and it's uh, together we stand something like that and that's the uh, commonwealth of kentucky so yeah kentucky is actually not a state it's a commonwealth <laughs> <laughs> but it's in within the united states of america so it's technically a state or not i don't know and they produce the kentucky straight bourbon they used to have the bourbon county which only bourbon from the Bourbon County, only whiskey from the Bourbon County could be called bourbon. And now it's called Faraday County. And now bourbon comes from the whole US, but Kentucky straight bourbon only comes from Kentucky. Uh, south of Kentucky is the state of Tennessee. Uh, red color background, and then we have a, a blue dot with uh, three white dots in it. And there we have the Tennessee whiskey, the two big distilleries there are the um, Jack Daniels, you know that, it's not a bourbon, it's a Tennessee whiskey and the George Dickel. To the north we have the uh, Maple Leaf and that's Canada where the Canadian whiskey comes from, but it's much, much smaller. And then in back in the old continent we do still do have the small island uh, southwest of Scotland and that is Ireland with the Irish whiskey. And then we have a bit of an upcomer, uh, which already has about nearly 100 years of history, which is the Japanese whiskey. And they really down into the art of making uh, whiskey. They are more going into the style of scotch, not into the style of bourbon. And uh, it's becoming really trendy and uh, really expensive as well to drink Japanese whiskey, but it's really a good stuff from Japan. Then we have one of the bigger producers of the whiskey. The second largest producer of whiskey worldwide. It's India. It's India. It's but part of the Commonwealth of Nations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. from, the, from the British Empire, there was whiskey coming into India and they are making whiskey. But uh, most of the whiskey in India is very, 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 very cheap mm -hmm. and not up to standard. So it's kind of like a rum whiskey mixture, not matured very good. But there are two distilleries in India which are... Uh, of extraordinary quality, so we include them here on the map because they have also have good quality single malt whiskey, but only from two distilleries. I think there's one other one which is being built up. So in five to ten years time, we're gonna have three good ones in India. And Germany is there for, uh, they have a lot of whiskey distilleries as well. Some of them, a few of them, a handful, are becoming more and more premium. So yes, there are international whiskies from France, from Austria, from Switzerland. Um, they're not that important yet. The big, big important main characters are Scotland. So, so we concentrate today on Scottish whiskies called Scotch in short. But there are different mm -hmm. Scotches out there. There's the cheap blended whiskey out there. 
and the higher quality single malt whiskey and we stay today with the single malt whiskies and there are rules about making scotch whiskey and uh, I have to look, the, it's legalese, it's, it's not really uh, good to read. Uh, what we have is... You have the UK law, not the EU law, because we are a bit of ahead of the time, because uh, it's going to be relevant again, because actually to just now, it's I think the EU law is about the Scotch whiskey, but uh, the British still have their old Scotch laws in, in place. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a mash from uh, cereals and mm -hmm. if you have a single malt whiskey then you have a malted barley only for this mash and uh, then you have to ferment it by just adding yeast nothing else so you aren't allowed as with the bourbon to heat it up and add uh, some sour and then uh, crack it by temperature and pressure. Mm -hmm. No, you just are able to add yeast. So you can't make a sour mash scotch. No. Sour mash scotch no, doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> then you have to produce, produce it uh, with an alcoholic strength of less than 94.8%. And this is uh, a little bit foolish because you can't distill higher than 94.8%. It's an, <laughs> what, how it's called, an etiotrope, something like that. So there is always water inside the structure, inside the mixture. So 94.8 is the maximum. But you aren't allowed to have molecular uh, grids, something in between uh, frames between uh, to bring it up. Then you have to mature it in oak casks. And that's the difference between Scotland and the EU. In the EU, uh, any wooden cask is allowed. And in Scotland, only oak casks are allowed, not exceeding 700 liters. And the whiskey has to be matured only in Scotland. That's for, uh, well, quality reason. And you have to mature at least for three years. Yeah, and uh, then you aren't able allowed to add something. <clears throat> and you have to have a minimum alcoholic strength uh, for bottling uh, with 40%. ABV. Then the single malt whiskey has to be produced in a single distillery but may be of different batches and therefore from different casks of the single distillery. <clears throat> and it has to be produced in pot stills that wasn't necessary uh, before 2009 when the new regulations came out. Then you were able to produce malted whiskey on column stills. Mm -hmm or malt whiskey on column stills. Now you have to use the classical pot stills, where a few complaints arose because there had been distilleries producing malt whiskey from column mm -hmm. stills. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's it. But they, they still call it malt whiskey, but it's not a single malt whiskey anymore. So you might see some minor changes in single malt to malt whiskey. Um, I do have the American legislation it's from the ATF, uh, good friends at the ATF, the Alcohol, <laughs> Tobacco, Products and Firearms. <laughs> yeah, firearms. And it's Title 27, Chapter 1, Subchapter A, Part 5, Subpart C. More legal uh, 5.22. And here you find even then, even more subchapter, one, <laughs> one I. And it's about bourbon whiskey. There's more about whiskey and corn whiskey, wheat, rye and stuff. I'm going with a bourbon whiskey. A bourbon whiskey is allowed to go called bourbon whiskey if it's not exceeding 160 proof and must be from fermented uh, fermented mash uh, and with not less than 51% corn. So bourbon is always majority corn. And that's the difference in taste to the For all of you not living mm -hmm. in the US, that's what we call maize. So the, yeah, corn, <laughs> the, the, the yellow stuff. And um, <laughs> you're allowed to add then uh, malted barley, barley, rye, wheat in the mash bill. So the Americans don't have only malted barley. They have a mash bill of different grains. Um, but you have to use more than 51% corn to call it a bourbon. And uh, that's why a bourbon is so sweet because corn is a bit more sweet. And then you have to, uh, you're not allowed to exceed 160 proof, that's 80% alcohol. 
Um, you're not allowed to fill it with more than 125 proof, which is 62.5%. And you have to store it in uh, uh, new uh, oak containers. Un uncharred new oak containers? Uncharred? Uh, you're allowed to char them later. It's legalese. It's really hard just to, to, uh, to read. And yeah, that's whiskey. So you have to use new barrels. That's the thing about the Americans. Uh, some of them produce whiskey. You can use used barrels then. But if you do a bourbon, you have to have new barrels. So that's where the, the flavor from the uh, bourbon comes from. And if you have a straight bourbon, you have to have one uh, from one state. And you have to have at least two years of age. So the American whiskey is a lot younger because they use new casks. And here you, you typically use used casks, ex bourbon casks, uh, and that makes it a bit more milder. Good. So what are we trying today? Um, if you now is for the beginners. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking for a sequence, then you could look after some attributes of the whiskey. So we start with the least alcoholic content, 40%, 43%, 46.3, 46.3. So upgoing alcohol content. But as well, you're looking at the ingredients you have in the whiskey. The more intense the whiskey is, probably due to a lot of smoky flavors, then you put it in the, in the later uh, tasting. And uh, if you have uh, weaker, smoother whiskies, then you put it in front. So we have the Ockentoshan, 12 years of age, which is a lowland with a triple distilled, so it's smoother. Then we have Tuli Bardin with no age statement on it, but finished in the second cask. This is uh, added uh, complexity or, or no added intensity. And then we have a whiskey from the Isle of Isla, where all the whiskies are very intense which is even more intense than the Tully Bardin. And then we have a very, very smoky whiskey in the end. So in this case, everything fits together, the low alcohol content to the higher ones, the triple distillation to the double distillation, uh, yeah, and the regions which are more and more intense. So the, the sequence in which we taste this whiskey was, is pretty easy to, to figure out. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's have a first first try with the Ockentoshan. And yeah, the Ockentoshan is a lowlander. And lowlander means that it's, uh, it's not law, but usually a lowlander is a triple distilled whiskey, which Ockentoshan is. And it's a 12-year-old Ockentoshan. Means it was 12 years in, in casks. But it wasn't uh, only in uh, just a single type of cask. It was in bourbon and sherry casks. So you have bourbon cask maturation, you have sherry cask maturation. Each for 12 years. Each for 12 years. And then you marry them together. So. Um, triple distillation means uh, you have first, first distillation from there. You, you get some 20, 25% ABV. Then you're moving to the next one. You're... you're reaching 50 to 60, and then the third one you go up to 80. Mm -hmm. So it's quite highly distilled, quite clean spirit, uh, and then matured for 12 years in casks. So we could imagine that this is quite a smooth whiskey. Okay, so again, for the beginners, uh, what do you, where do you pour? We've poured it in the whiskey.com or whiskey.de glass, which was designed by you. But mm -hmm. if you don't have that glass, which why? Because it's not internationally available. Um, what, what are you looking for in a glass? Uh, so we look for a tulip, the shape. So going uh, smaller to the top, so that the vapors arising from the whiskey, from the level of the whiskey, uh, are captured inside this tulip. And the specialty of this glass is that we have a lip on top so that the liquid flows out quite broad on your tongue so that you do not have this very small uh, whiskey going to the back of your tongue where you taste all the bitterness, but it's going broad onto your tongue and gives a complete uh, taste. And then we have a small stem so that you are able to, to, to grab the glass. And if you have it on the 
uh, on the table and there's lots of things going on on your table and you uh, hit it, it won't fall over. So we have a, a big stand uh, below. This is it and it's from crystal glass so mm -hmm. that you have a, a full uh, shiny glowing whiskey inside. This. So if you're a beginner, the, the most important thing that you have to look for is the tulip, tulip shape. So a sherry glass or a white wine glass is as well mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. But you have to be a little bit more careful because none of those glasses has a lip on top. Mm -hmm. So sip it very carefully. Okay. So, uh, and how much do you fill in? A dram. A, a dram would be this much. So, so twice <laughs> or three times as much. Uh, we have four to go, so we reduce the whiskey in our glass. But a typical dram you buy in Scotland is uh, a fifth of a gill. It was in former times. Nowadays, it's a sixth of a gill, which brought quite a riot up in Scotland. <laughs> and a gill is a sixth of a pint or twelfth of a pint, something like this. Or US pints or UK pints? UK <laughs> imperial pints <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so on. So it's a 28 mils. It had been 35 mils, but they reduced it to 28 mils. And uh, yeah, just so this is half of that. Just just uh, a little sip of it so that you feel comfortable. No, well, Scott will have a big sip. A big sip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and, and then, then we have, how do you taste the whiskey? Uh, so first to the glass again. There are those cylinder-shaped glasses where Humphrey Bogart drank his whiskey. Oh, the tumbler. <laughs> the tumbler where the ice fits in quite easily, which has a thick bottom uh, so that you don't... Uh, attack the ice by the warmth of your hand, it won't melt, and uh, this is completely wrong. So whatever, all the tumbler is <laughs> wrong in every direction. You want to warm up your whiskey because warmer whiskey gives up more flavors. Uh, you want to have a tulip so you do not lose the vapors. So tumbler is everything wrong with it. Yeah, tumbler is for drinking. Uh, yeah. One of these whiskey glasses is for enjoying, enjoying. enjoying whiskey. Yeah. So if you're at a, at a bar and it's really dusty and you just want to down a few, uh, <laughs> then you get a tumble and, and if don't you don't do that. <laughs> and if you want to really enjoy it back at home uh, in your mm -hmm. living room, then get one of these glasses. Yeah, what to say more? Then first you smell because mm -hmm. most of the Enjoyment is from the taste. You taste a thousand more uh, molecules, different molecules than you have on your tongue. Okay, on the tongue you have the, the main uh, influences like saltiness, sweetness, sourness, bitterness. But there's as well the umami, which is some protein taste where you have, they found out 32 different protein tasting buds in, on your tongue. So uh, umami is immense. But uh, there are nerves uh, on the roof of your mouth uh, where there is a direct uh, nerve connection into your brain in the olfactory center. And there you learn tastes. On your tongue, you have inherited taste, which is through, through your genes, through your genome. And the smell in your olf olfactory center, this is learned. So what you learned in your youthness, uh, wild pork with mint sauce, <laughs> so this is a different or the Germans they in, in, enjoy not me kraut sour kraut that's uh, kind of good <laughs> yeah not me uh, so everybody mm -hmm. learns different tastes and smelling brings out all those learned tastes which you are able to remember the peaches the pears the apples the smoke and so on so smelling is much more important than swallowing and therefore, you smell a lot in front before you really start to taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what do you smell? Oh, this one is a. Uh, in the beginning, it's a bit malty, and then you you start to realize, okay, there's a bit of sherry in that. There's a bit of fruitiness. There's a bit of a citrus note. A bit of a. A bit of a round note, banana note, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say, uh, these whiskies which we have here are 
uh, affordable. They are not the really expensive ones, they are affordable and they are all below 30 euros, dollars, pounds. This one is close to 40, but all are very, very affordable and they are really good ones. So they have a very good price value relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and therefore in this whiskey, all the major smells you find in a single malt whiskey are present. The maltiness, the fruitiness, but also the beginning cask inference for 12 years of maturation in oak casks. So everything is there. And the uh, tagline, delicate and layered, it's, it's really hitting the point. No? Mm -hmm. So, and after you've smelled to your satisfaction and yeah, there are no wrong answers for the, for the <laughs> smells, um, it's, it's really uh, subjective, and then you have a try. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Mm -hmm. So this is juicy, fruity, some citrus, orange notes in it. There's this maltiness, caramel, and then in the late taste, the beginning aftertaste, there's the oakiness in it. And... Uh, slightly start of grapefruit probably so this is a, a wonderful complex uh, single malt whiskey yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like it um, it's said to always have the whiskey in your mouth for as long as it was matured in the, uh, in, the uh, in the cask in seconds for the year so 12 year old whiskey 12 seconds mm -hmm. this one you really realize it's a it's a lowlander, it's a typical lowlander. It's very mild, very round, very creamy. Um, nicely, uh, nice mixture between a, a bourbon style character and a sherry character mm -hmm. with the uh, bit of a red fruits, strawberries, uh, berries, grapes, uh, but together with a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of caramel oh. and that, that hint of sweetness. Or not the hint. Uh, there had been two questions I would like to answer. The first was, uh, or it was not a, a question, more a remark. Uh, those are not whiskies for beginners. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is a, qu uh, a question of definition because for a beginner's tasting, you should cover all the different tastes so that a beginner can say, this is one for me and that's not for me. There are some beginners which uh, said whiskey is nothing for me and then they taste a very stinky, smoky mm -hmm. whiskey mm -hmm. and then they say if I would have known I would ever stay to whiskey so <laughs> it is for a beginner to see the complete uh, arena which is possible in whiskies and not to pay too much so this is for the beginners first then was the question of G-Man uh, where may I buy those glasses unfortunately we do not sell it uh, outside Germany and Austria uh, because uh, shipment is too difficult and too expensive for us in the moment. Uh, yeah, it's, will... it's the red tape. Shipment, shipment is uh, possible. <laughs> <laughs> shipment but, is not the problem. But, but you, you triple the price for a glass easily. But yes, you... but we will eventually, hopefully, uh, sell at some point <laughs> outside Germany. But we still have to get the you know, all the, the alcohol taxes and that kind of stuff. Um, for like, the glasses, not. But to have just the glasses shipped out but the uh, means, means a lot of work, additional work. Yeah. Yes. So, but we're already sending to one foreign country, Austria. <laughs> so if you can send to one, you can send to many. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see about that next yeah. year. <laughs> Okay, so um, we've talked about this uh, Orkentoschen now here. And um, now we want to see how is this actually produced? How do we produce whiskey? And whiskey starts off with grain. So we have uh, barley. And what we need is we don't need the uh, starch within the grain, but we need sugar. So what we do is we malt it. So we need to germination. And what you do is you uh, take the, the grain and you soak it in about one day. Some do 16 hours, some do 24 hours. And then the, the grain is wet and it has soaked up the, uh, the water and it starts to germinate. 
and then you spread it out in a room like this and you have to regularly turn it. So uh, this is a very old style of turning. You go in diagonal. Yeah, they won't do that. It's just, it's just for show. And <laughs> uh, you open the windows so there is no um, Moisture, fungi, yeah. fungi growing in the mold, but it's just germination. And what happens is the uh, the the plant wants to grow, the seed wants to grow, so it transfers the uh, the starch into sugar and wants to produce from the sugar cellulose to be the new plant. But uh, at the point when the sh most of the sugar is created, you stop it and you dry it. And then you are left with a dry, very, very sweet malt grain. And you uh, then have to mill it down into coarse grist and then it goes off to the mash tun. This is one of the newer mash tuns, a stainless steel lauder tun. And there you sprinkle on hot water and you dilute all the sugars and a few of the starches as well out of the grist. And uh, this is done here in a new one. There are older ones. This one here is a, an old style mesh tun. It's a copper mesh tun with a bit of a wooden surrounding for insulation so you don't have to heat it that much. Um, you do have more than one time that you wash out these sugars so they are three times you often do that and um, that's the look inside the mash towns there are rakes inside and they slowly turn it and in the end you have a very sugary sweet water and that is being drained by a false floor through a sieve and then you have that very sugary substance and that sugary substance then can be fermented into alcohol and that's what the Scot Scottish people call wash bags. The wash bags are big, big, big tops that are used for fermentation. So you add the yeast and then it starts to ferment. You also have to look at the temperature very closely to fill it in with the right temperature. Uh, and then you have, uh, have to have a look if you have wooden fermenters or steel fermenters and they do insulation at a different rate. So the temperature really does a lot for the creation of the flavors within that stuff. The stuff is called wash and it contains alcohol and there is CO2 rising. So it produces alcohol and CO2 and then you see the bubbles forming. It's no longer called CO2. It's not longer called it's CO2. It's called ferment, fer fermentation gas. Oh yeah, yeah, CO2 yeah. has such a negative uh, flavor to it, so now it's fermentation gas. Uh, so the fermentation gas rises <laughs> and you have to have uh, good ventilation in the room because if you have the fermentation gas within that room, then uh, you could suffocate because uh, CO2 is not breathable. Uh, it's breathable, it's not toxic, but uh, it doesn't contain any, uh, it displaces the um, oxygen. oxygen in the room. So um, after that, we have a, kind of a beer and that beer is uh, without hops and it has about 8% alcohol and you uh, have to now distill the alcohol. And this here are very iconic stills. And you see, you always have pairs in the back. There is a big one and a small one. Then you have here on the very right is a big one and left to it is a small one. So you have double distillation. The big one is the wash still. So that's where the wash comes in and it's being distilled from 8% to about 25%. The volume reduces a lot. The volume reduces a lot. So you don't need such a big still for the second distillation, the spirit still. And the spirit still is very important for the shape. So if you have a very tall spirit still, and then you have a very good separation of alcohol, a very fine spirit. If you have a very straight one, then all the oily characters can also be distilled. So you have a, a rough one, a very intense one. And, and then you have different shapes like a constriction or this reflux bowl where you have turbulences and that prevents the alcohol from rising very fast. So it's more of a fine spirit. Definitely the speed has something to do with the, with the flavor. And that is done by the distilling, the distiller. And here you see another still uh, in the pot. It is being uh, heated up. And then you have the watch glasses where you can see how high it's bubbling. And the alcoholic fumes come to that large cylinder on the left. 
and that cylinder is uh, done with uh, river water, with cold river water flown through and that cools down the alcoholic vapors and they begin to condense again, so it's called a condenser, and then you have liquid alcohol back again. And the still master is actually um, checking everything, checking the alcohol levels, and the spirit still the, has to be cut in, into pieces. You have the four shots, which are very, very light, and very, very faint, and they're not that sharp. much sharp. sharp. So they're being uh, sent to a different tank. Then you have the heart piece, the middle cut, which is the, the right flavors, the alcohol the carry, that carries the flavors. And then the end, you have the, the tails, and the tails are, are longer alcohols, fusel alcohols. They typically do headaches and they are very bitter and very not pleasant. So they're also being stored in a different tank. And the heart piece is what uh, the new make spirit is. And that is pretty high. So it's being diluted down before it's then filled into casks. So here we see a, a warehouse in Scotland, a very traditional warehouse. Uh, traditional tonnage warehouses have usually three stories tall. If you have big, big sherry casks, then usually two stories tall. But I think these are big sherry casks stored three high, so a bit unusual here. And you have stamped wooden, uh, not wooden, uh, clay, clay floors, floors yeah. and big stone walls. So it's a very cool, damp, moist atmosphere. And that's perfect for the scotch to mature because scotch wants to mature very long. So 10 years, it's pretty much an entry level of scotch malt and it can go up to 40, 50 years of age. Um, but we do enjoy whiskey. Oh, oh. Uh, during the maturation, there is evaporation. So this is called the angel's share. So the uh, the cask is not fully airtight, so there's a bit of breathing going on in the cask. So the alcohol evaporates, and the angels want to have their share as well. So they fly to Scotland, and then they They're sitting on the clouds above the distillery, and they smell it. Yeah. And there you can see how much you do lose during maturation. A very old cask, you may have a rest of twenty-five percent in the cask. Very very old casks. Yeah. Yes. So um, then we have uh, a look at the modern production. So it's still being done all the same, but you have to have a bit more careful storage. So the old Scotsman with the kilt is not rolling one cask at a time into the old Dunwich warehouse. Fast but with a forklift. <laughs> there's a guy, a Scotsman with his kilt on a forklift, <laughs> lifting a lot of barrels or a lot of casks into these warehouses and uh, putting them on top of each other. And to give you a little overview, this is one of the warehouses. And now we have a look at one distillery. And these are the warehouses of one distillery. I don't think they are all of the warehouses, but to be fair, that's one of the very, very big distilleries of uh, Scotland. So 30, 40 warehouses are not unusual for a Scottish warehouse. Yes, yeah, for a big uh, brand. Distillery. Yeah. For a big brand, it's not unusual. Okay, so in the end, we do have them in the cask. And that's the second whiskey, what, what we want to yeah, talk about um, today. There had been a few questions in between that these are not really uh, starting whiskies. So again, uh, somebody said he would have taken one of each region. Well, the region, uh, this is Lowlands, this is Highlands, this is Isla, this is Islands. So we have every region. Uh, uh, not every space region. Side we're missing, uh, but space side, but uh, Highlands is close to the space side, or yes. inside the space it's, side. This is very close yeah. to the space side. So, and uh, to have the uh, other ones, uh, uh, like Campbelltown, so on, you have, we would have had more than four. Yes, there are other whiskies that may be a bit more suitable for beginners, but these ones really show the like different the differences, styles, yeah. the differences and the different. Uh, Interesting things. Now, I've just talked about the maturation, and this year we're going to talk about the uh, cast maturation, but let's have a try while we do that. Yeah. So, there have been other whiskies mentioned uh, up there, but most of them have been a lot more expensive than the ones we've chosen. So, this one is around 28, 29. 
euros. And this is a Tulip Bardin. And if you see those Gallic names like Orchentoschen, Tulip Bardin, Buna Haven, they are all pronounced on the second syllable. So this is Old Gallic. There are very few distilleries which are pronounced on the first syllable. Those are Nordic names or modern English names. So if you're not uh, quite sure how to pronounce such a distillery name, uh, do it on the second syllable and you most often write. Mm -hmm. Now we have the Tullibard in 228. No, it's not 228 years old. It's They're not <laughs> only 228 <laughs> bottles, no. <laughs> it's uh, the size of the cask. Tully Barden is uh, had a bit of a closing time, so they have a bit of a younger whiskey, so they do no age statement. And they write the the size of the barrel they finished the whiskey in. So we wanted to go through uh, what whiskey what where whiskey is matured in, which casks. So typically the Americans mature in juvenile first fill American white oak barrels. Then those barrels are shipped after two to four years to Scotland and the Scottish people, they use those, those casks not only once, but multiple times. Mm -hmm. So up to 30, 40 years is typical. And then which each maturation in those used, used, reused casks, uh, the amount of flavors sucked out of the whiskey, uh, of the walls of the whiskey cask is reducing, so you get an exponential reducing function. And therefore, having re reused casts typically lead to a very white, clear, uh, not very uh, oaky whiskey. And therefore, uh, they move those whiskies into fresh casks from very different sources. Uh, most of them are from Jerez, from the southwest of Spain. So those are the sherry casks, uh, different sherries. And then close by is uh, Portugal with the Porto region and the port wine. Uh, then you go out to the sea, to the island of Madeira, uh, where casks are with those uh, heavy uh, wines, but also from Sicily, the Marsala, and uh, well, there had been whiskey casks from the Krim and from Tokhair and wine casks brick cask where wine is matured for getting a little bit of oaky influence and this one is from a burgundy or is finished in a burgundy wine cask. Burgundy is a region at the river Rhone in the middle of France and those are not the extreme red wines from the south of France but a little bit more medium and uh, this is the Chateau de Chassagne Montrachet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is at the River Sone, I think, which is a, uh, a minor river flowing into the Rhone, or is the Sone renamed to so uh, Rhone? Oh, I'm not quite sure. Um, but these are red wine casks they use for maturation. So first is a maturation for a given time in refill ex bourbon casks, and then they refill it, so they have to put their hands on and empty the cask to fill it in new brick wine casks for further maturation. With the Ockintoshin, we had a parallel maturation of ex bourbon casks and ex sherry casks and then mixing them together. And here we have a maturation after each other, which leads to a smoother taste of the oak from the second cask because it's only three, six, nine months in the finishing cask And this does not lead to those tannins coming out of the oak. And the longer whiskey resides in an oak cask, the more tannins. And those are the, the bitter uh, substances coming out of the walls. Yeah, I, I think I'm too dry in my mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do you smell? Uh, vanilla first, if I have the right distance. Then lots of fruits, the red wine coming up of a little chocolate, a little oakiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, definitely much more on the uh, grapey and mm -hmm. uh, berry side. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
it's lovely, but it's still very round and and very creamy. Yeah. What we also have is a 43% ABV, a little bit more, mm -hmm. which drives the aromas more into your nose. So the alcohol is carrying the aroma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. This is younger and more intense than the Okantoshin is, but there are these uh, massive fruits in it, these red, red apples, red berries coming from, yeah, from the distillery cracker and the cask. And then in the aftertaste, uh, there's vanilla, there's caramel, there's a little spiciness from the oak wood. And um, to say, this is a different oakiness because the finishing is done in those brick casts from France. And this is French limousin oak. And if you have a whiskey being for a couple of years in limousin oak, then you have a distinct oakiness in it, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more um, flavor in it. It's, it's a lot stronger with a lot more fruitiness and it's more of a dark fruitiness, more of the dried fruits. There is more oak, a little bit of bitterness, a bit of sweetness, there's a bit of chocolate in there. Mm. So it's a, it's more on the, the cask side, whereas the oak torsion was a bit, mm, bit sherry in there. Here you do have the, the dark burgundy wood finish, definitely. Yeah. So definitely this one is is younger. Mm -hmm. You can't tell how young it is. You can feel if a whiskey is extremely young and you have a metallic mm -hmm. dreading inside of your mouth. Uh, this one has not. So from a, an age of five to seven year, this young taste vanishes. If you have a triple distilled malt, then this taste will never appear because it's highly distilled. If you have a double distillation, like with the Tuli Barlin, uh, then if the whiskey is very young, you might ha have this metallic youthness in your mouth, but this is gone already here. And because the first cars had been probably quite weak, they added the finishing in those red wine burgundy casks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Good. So um, we've now had a look at uh, the cask finishes and what a cask can do to a whiskey. Now the next one is going to be an Isla whiskey. An Isla whiskey is always associated with smokiness. The 12 year old is not that smoky. But however, we're going to have a look now at how comes smokiness into whiskey. And that's because of peat. Yeah, not peat like Peter, but uh, peat like the dirt stuff. <laughs> so peat is a compressed organic substance, let's call it that, like grass and roots, roots and that kind of stuff in an, um, in an environment where there's no oxygen. So it can't oxidize and uh, get out. So it's, it's one of the first um, steps towards coal. And you can have peat with a lot of fiber in it. You can have peat that is more going into uh, the direction of coal, of brown coal. And this here is one of the more fibery types. And you can't take the peat and put it into a bottle. But uh, what you <laughs> it do... It would taste is, nothing. It would taste nothing. It's, it tastes muddy. And um, what you do is you burn it in a kiln. And here you see one of these kilns where you take the dried peat. Usually an old Scotsman goes out, cuts the peat and then puts it out to dry. And then it's being put into one of these kilns. And the kilns primarily produce hot air, but also smoke. Here you can see at the bottom there's a bit of a fire coming down. And then you have the 
smoke rising and usually you put a bit of water on it and then it really 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 smokes and this so is going barely, quite fast it's barely, a very good chimney yeah <laughs> this is a uh, port allen so this is a professional uh, <laughs> malting, yeah. malting with a lot of peat smoke in it and the smoke then comes to the drying room where at the beginning i've told you that you have to dry the malt and whereas uh like Orkentoshen and Tullibardin smoke, uh, don't smoke, they have hot air. Um, it becomes a non peaty whiskey. Here you have a smoky atmosphere and it's really, really moist in there. So the moisturize, uh, the, the um, water from the germinated malt is getting into the air and the malt is becoming dry and also very, very smoky. Uh, the smoke level is measured in parts per million also known as PPM. And here we see a chimney, one of the pagoda roofs, and usually you have to have a pretty big chimney for all that smoke to rise. And But you uh, see regulations forbid yeah. using those chimneys a lot, so there's only small amount of classical produced yeah. uh, But you still see it from here yeah. to there. And, and you smell it from and here to there. <laughs> yeah, and also you see these uh, pagoda roofs, and it's kind of an icon of mm. the uh, Scotch malt industry, where you see one of these pagoda roofs, usually you find a distillery. Yeah, and you need that, that roof because all of the rain would fall down on the... On the barley. Yeah, and we'll mm -hmm. make it wet again. Yeah. So in the end, you do have the smoke in the whiskey, and it's measured in ppm, parts per million. A very light smoky whiskey, like the Buna Haven 12 here, mm, I would say it has about 5, maybe 10% ppm, or 10% mm -hmm. ppm. And a more smoky whiskey, like uh, an Artbeck or like a Woolen, they have 45 ppm. Like this Lidjik, uh, Lidjik, Lidjik. I heard it twice, <laughs> but can't remember the exact pronunciation. Lidjik. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This has also a very high number of ppm, which is probably around in the 40s. So, yeah, we're enough said. coming to the Buna Haven, 12 years of age. This is an Isla whiskey with 12 years of age. Uh, so there is quite a maturation. And this one has 46.3 ABV, so it's stronger than the rest. And it's unchill filtered, means the whiskey becomes cloudy if it's raw from the cask and it's diluted or it's becoming cold over ice and it gets cloudy. And that cloudiness isn't wanted by connoisseurs. So in the production process, some whiskies are cooled down to zero or a little bit above freezing temperature. And then going through a filter, so all those uh, uh, dust components are filtered out. And then it goes to the bottle. And when they become cold again, uh, get cold again, then the haziness won't start again. And this one is unchill filtered. So this one is uh, has more of those uh, compounds in it. And it's said to be more intense, therefore. So there's fruitiness on the cork, but not no smell. Yeah, I've uh, already okay. put it on your side. No smell of smokiness. So pouring in a hidden glass is not that easy. Do you two <laughs> and your extended family do tastings together during the holidays? Cheers uh, from some dude. <laughs> uh, we have extended family and they're enjoying it online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Bunnehaven is one of the distilleries on Isla, which are, is located at the mm -hmm. coasts of the Sound of Isla, between the Isle of Jura and the Isle of Isla. And it's facing the Sound, and here on the bottle you can see a salesman, sailman, uh, with a steering wheel in front. And uh, the last, the people were were able to see from the Isle of Isla was the distillery of Bunnehaven when they're going out into the North Sea for shipping, uh, fishing. And when their ships came back, the first they've seen uh, was the distillery of Bunnehaven. And there is a, a song called Westering Home, which contains, I think, the whiskey and the Isle of Isla as mm -hmm. well. And if they looked at their map, and then they were very confused because uh, mm -hmm. Bunnehaven, how is Bunnehaven spelled? with three N's or with four N's. And the Royal Majesty Ordnance Survey 
uh, actually asked the guys in the town, uh, how is he Buna haven't spelled? And they said with two N. And then they did it with uh, two N's at the beginning and two N's at the end. And the people in the town didn't mean that. They meant the two N's at the beginning and the N in the end is just one. So in the maps, they are marked as Buna haben with four N's <laughs> and on the bottle it's three ends and the people in the town uh, they always said we want to be the ones with three ends but mm, <laughs> they asked the order in Serbia a couple of times but they didn't want to change it so <laughs> there's a bit of a those guys in, in, in London from the military service yeah <laughs> mm. I'm not quite sure if, the, if ordinance ordinance is also uh, I think uh, artillery and uh, <laughs> are these the same guys? Like, we have the maps, we draw the maps, and we bomb the maps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm. this is Seashore. Little is stinky. Mm -hmm. This is this is Isla. This is the intensity, the smell of the sea of Isla. But there's close to no smoke in it. Probably a little bit faint smoke in it some nuttiness Car caramel yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's atypical for an isla malt you do have almost no smokiness at all in there and yes it's it's very intense it's uh you do realize there's a lot of sherry character in there dried fruits Oh, and and a little bit of uh, vanilla and, and sweetness from the bourbon as well. It's a well-rounded one as well. It's strange that we have so many rounded whiskies uh, today on the cask. Um, there are whiskies from Bune Haven, like the Teutach, I think it's mm -hmm. called, which contain very smoky whiskey as well. Uh, <clears throat> so there you can have this typical very smoky whiskey but they produce some weeks in the year they produce this heavily smoky whiskey and then typically the hold stills and uh, pipes are cleaned for maintenance once a year and the smoky whiskey is only produced prior to maintenance and after that they start again without smoke in it Probably there are some some residue of smokiness inside the whiskey so that the cask have a little bit of smoke influence. But there is another chance to get smokiness into the whiskey. Uh, the cask is heated from the inside until the staves get a temperature of above 150 degrees centigrade. It's like 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the cellulosis from the staves, from the wood, is cracked uh, into wood sugars and those wood, sh wood sugars are caramelized and therefore the brown color of the whiskey comes from and uh, therefore uh, a little well sweetness caramel note comes up as well. There's a hardening substance in the wood called lignin and that one is cut by heat into vanillin and this vanillin brings this vanilla smell in it. And then the cask is burned out with clear, free flame so that there's a charcoal layer uh, starting on the inside. And between that charcoal layer and the caramelized wood sugar layer, there in between is a small region of a few mills in which some phenols are activated. And those you can have in non-smoky uh, non whiskey as the pity component this mm -hmm. might be the reason for this very little oh it's just a bit of, of bit of a peatiness because it says they have a hint of seaside smoke in it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah cheers, cheers. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is really intense. It hits your tongue, it hits your mouth. So very intense on my tongue. There's a spiciness on my tongue. The mouth is fully yeah, laden with a whiskey and uh, there's a second gulp. It's mouth watering. It's 
So this is really, really massive and intense. There is some nuttiness, walnuts, probably in the aftertaste. This is massive. It's 46.3, so there's more alcohol in it. Um, this helps with the transfer of the aromas, but the main component of the whiskey is as well very, very intense. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I do have a bit of a smoke here, here and there. So in the taste, I do feel a bit of a smoke. It's one of these ashy smokes that you have after a bonfire, after a festival in the morning, but combined with a lot of grapey flavors, a bit of a sour flavor as well, and uh, a good amount of oak as well. Mm, I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, later on now I have the smoke as well. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so we're close to an hour. We have 20 minutes to go, I think. <laughs> but the Buna Heaven is a great one. I, I yeah. really do like it. Mm -hmm. So um, now we've talked, in the beginning, we've talked about what international whiskeys there are, as 90% of the premium whiskey comes from Scotland. What regions are there? Yeah, we start here with a map of Scotland. You see the dark orange labeled the Highlands, those are legally the Highlands and uh, they are divided in two path, parts, the Northern Highlands and the Normal Highlands and below the eye there's a small white, this is a lake, this is Loch Ness uh, with Nessie in it <laughs> and this is a geological fault line uh, going diagonal through Scotland and north of that it's called the uh, Northern Highlands and south of that it's called the Highlands. And the Dalwini whiskey is a typical Highland whiskey and the Glenmorangie is a Northern Highland whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, you see the red square, that is Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. And uh, yeah. Where the land is written, L A and D, there is a sub region of the Highlands, it's called the Spay side, where the river Spay and all there, the small rivers flowing into the Spay give a new region called the Spay side, where most of the distilleries in Scotland are located in. And here you can see the Glenfarclas and the Glenfiddich, uh, typical uh, Spay side whiskies. Yeah, next one is the Lowlands, um, just below the Highlands. And the Lowlands had been a legal con construct because uh, whiskey was produced, 95% of the whiskey was produced in the Lowlands because the Highlands were in former times in the uh, late 18th century and the beginning 19th century very uh, rural, had no r clear roads, no trains at all. And then King, I think it was King Edward the something, uh, he started uh, and said, well, the Highland whiskey is much better than the Lowland whiskey, because in the Lowlands there were just masses and no competition for quality. And uh, the uh, distills were taxed due to the content of the still. So the more you bring through the stills, less quality, the cheaper the whiskey would be. And in the Highlands they produced by pot stills and the whiskey was much better. So he always asked for Highland whiskey and then in 1823 he issued a law that distilling in the Highlands is legal uh, and the distilleries had to apply for a license. And with that uh, whiskey production in the Highlands started to grow. All those thousands of small farm distilleries died and the f a few hundred of good distilleries uh, flourished. And then the railways were built, the whiskey was able uh, to be brought into the uh, capitals, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, so money flew into the highlands. And uh, well, on the other hand, the tax excisemen were able <laughs> to go into the highlands and tax it. So it was quite a interesting time and here we have two lowland the Ockentoshen we just had 
for taste with a three pot still maturation and the Glen Kinchy, which only has two stills, which is produced in a Highland still, uh, Highland style, and there are two stills. Yeah, then we have the islands, which are situated mostly on the western coast of Isla, uh, of the mainland of Scotland, because there the storms from the Atlantic move in and, and cut the, uh, the coast into pieces. And first is the, on very low on the east side, the small islands, the Isle of Arran, <clears throat> where the Arran distillery is working since 1995. Quite a new one uh, on the left side, on the western side of that Isle of Arran, the peninsula of Kintyre is located with the main capital of Campbelltown. And Campbelltown was the former major city of the whiskey production in Scotland with 35 distilleries, I think. Uh, then all distilleries closed after each other until only two were left. One produced constantly, the other was interrupted multiple times. <clears throat> and today there, they have three stills again, uh, distilleries again producing whiskey down there. And the most important is Springbank, uh, where the whiskey is done mostly really by hand. <clears throat> North of that is the Isle of Jura, which just has one distillery, the Jura distillery. Uh, and north of that is a little bit bigger, uh, looking a little bit like a rabbit. That one is Mull, where the Lidgic whiskey from the Tobomori distillery comes from. This one. And further to the north, a bigger island is the Isle of Skye, which is now connected by a bridge to the mainland and the Talisker distillery is located there. And that is one of the very few distilleries pronounced on the first syllable. Talisca, it's a Nordic name. Then going much up to the north, the Orkney Islands. Also <coughs> pronounced on the first syllable, well, Orkney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Orkney, no, Orkney. <laughs> so it's they, I think, were given as a gift by the Nordic king when he mm -hmm. uh, gave a princess to a Scottish king. Yes, and they were all Vikings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Highland Park. So Highland Park is going with all the Viking, the Nordic mythology and all that kind of stuff. So yes, there are Nordic <clears throat> and Viking influences within whiskey. Yeah, and then the very last one is Isla, the Isle of Isla. And that is the, the region where for the, uh, well, the connoisseurs, the experts in whiskey tasting, uh, I think 40% of all those whiskies, the high-end whiskies, come from the Isle of Isla. And the Isle of Isla is a qual quite a small island with less than 3,000 inhabitants, mm -hmm. has seven, eight, nine st distilleries, how you call, uh, uh, count them, and Bunahaven, which we just tasted, and Beaumore, uh, one of the famous, very famous distilleries there. Others on Isla as well. Yeah. So we just had the Buna Heaven, one of the Isla ones, and now we're going for the Legic, Legic from the Isle of Mull. Mull. The distillery is called Tobomori, and there is the Tobomori whiskey as well from that distillery. And the Tobomori whiskey is the unpeated, unsmoky, and the Legic distillery is the smoky one. Port Ellen, part of Lagavulin, or part of La, part of Lafroig. Port Ellen is a town, and <laughs> I don't think there's Lafroy and Lagavulin as a town, maybe. <laughs> I think they belong to Port Ellen. So Port Ellen, uh, Lagavulin and Lafroy is part of Port Ellen. Uh, both distilleries get their malt from Port Ellen, mm -hmm. and the company who owns Lagavulin owns Port, Port Ellen. Ellen. Yeah, but there is a big And contract. the warehouses of Port Ellen contain Lagavulin, yeah. <laughs> but not for long anymore because Port Ellen is going to open up again, so they need the space probably at some point of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So already smoky here in the air. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we still have one chapter of uh, 
Beginner's whiskey mm. guide to uh, enjoying whiskey. So, um, how do you mix whiskey? Never mix whiskey. Yeah, no. <laughs> point of where you mix whiskey. First of all, do you mix it with Coke, Coca-Cola or Pepsi or anything? Don't do it. <laughs> no, it's uh, if you mix whiskey with, uh, with some soft drink, Coke, then it's for um, an alcoholic consumption. So it's it's kind of pushing away the uh, the more intense whiskey. flavor of mm -hmm. uh, of whiskey and replaces it with sugar. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Coke tastes like, sugar, and that's for getting the alcohol inside your body without having. If you drink huge amounts of whiskey, you will have the alcoholic flavor. So if you try to enjoy whiskey. Don't mix it with Coke. But, but I once had a, a whiskey Coke uh, mix video here on YouTube. And there I recognized that mixing Coke with better whiskey tastes better. <laughs> yeah. And then you waste more good whiskey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the other question is mixing it with ice. Mm. Um, again... If you like alcoholic consumption and you want to consume huge amounts of alcohol, then putting ice into your whiskey is favorable because then you don't feel the alcohol that much. But you will also not feel the flavor, not taste the flavor. So no, if you want to enjoy alcohol, uh, whiskey, really enjoy whiskey, the flavors of the whiskey, don't add ice. If you don't like your whiskey, Add ice. <laughs> uh, so in the last one, do you add water? That depends. That depends. So this never got, uh, soda, never sparkling water. Always a flat water, very yeah. flat water. Not not Mineral, much. Very few minerals. In very it. few minerals. So you don't change the whiskey at all. And uh, the thing is, the Scottish always say, never drink whiskey without water, and water without whiskey. So yeah. And if you add water, what we're going to do later, and then you're going to change the flavor of the whiskey. Good. I've said enough about mixing the whiskey. And basically, don't mix it. Add a little water. There are a few questions up there. Are there? How long does a sealed bottle of whiskey last in the best case scenario? Well, we have whiskeys uh, recovered from Antarctica. Which oh, lasted over a hundred years. Shackleton, the Shackleton, Shackleton expedition whiskey, from yeah. 1814? Something around there. Um, 12, 1812, I think he started really, maybe at 12. Re returning 1914. And then some of the... Was it 19 uh, or 18? 19. 19, yeah, sure. And then 19. they Sorry. returned and had to go to war and die there. Oh. Uh, so they <laughs> suffered... Two years of... But, uh, yeah, yeah, he lost okay. He lost two of the three ships. And the two ships that sunk had a bit of... What was it? McAllen in it? I think it was McAllen. And they recovered the bottles. And I think they didn't have the labels on it. The labels were gone. But the whiskey inside was pretty enjoyable. But it was not a very expensive whiskey. So it was kind of a... They just bought six bottles of cheap whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> from back of 1914 so what was the funny thing you've ever done while whiskey drunk i was never whiskey drunk no sorry uh why does the distillery water down uh, water down cast strength well this is while a lot of people does not uh, are not able to reduce cast strength into drinking strength uh, whiskey or which whiskey, which is correct, uh, depends on where you live. If you live in uh, Scotland, it's whiskey. So the British saying is whiskey. And then if you live in America, it's mostly whiskey. There Not always. Make there a smark. Are, make a smark <laughs> is a whiskey. <laughs> that depended on, on which uh, countryman uh, emigrated to the US because the Irish write whiskey. They used to write, yeah. there is a good article on whiskey.com about whiskey and whiskey. So mm -hmm. if you Google whiskey and whiskey, whiskey.com will be in the top three. So have a look at that article. I think you, you wrote it a few years, years ago. And uh, it, it explains where the whiskey and the whiskey comes from. Good. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, JB Horst. <laughs> Can you do non-whiskey videos in English? Yes, there was a question again up there. Uh, uh, I'm doing the videos on, on, on Tesla 
and uh, some uh, well didactic uh, videos. Uh, I have no more time. It's so much work to do. No, sorry. Oh, I always <laughs> wanted you to make the whiskey uh, the videos in English. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Enough said, let's have a little bit of a uh, uh -huh. logic. So this is very, very smoky, extremely. And you typically are overwhelmed with the, uh, with the smoke in the whiskey. And uh, if you're going in a, uh, in a lion's cage, no, not in the cage, in, in the lion's house where the cage is in, then you smell this intense smell of the lions. But after a quarter of an hour, it's gone your nose receptors have adapted to that extreme smell and this is the same with smoky whiskey you you adapt to that smokiness and then after 10 15 20 seconds you're able to smell well things below that smoke and here i have some maltiness a little citrus note some fruitiness but also a little more older fruits like dates, something. But that shows through if you smell much longer on the whiskey and do not drink it immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a nice one. You do have a lot of smoke in there. So it, it really feels like an Isla whiskey, but yeah, it's a, a smoky logic. And... Uh, it starts off with a with a bonfire smoke and ends up with an ashy smoke. So kind of a, a little bit of a journey from the, the burning bonfire to the burnt down bonfire with the ashiness. Uh, mm. Tom Jackson, the Irish monks, they made it and Scottish took it and dropped the E. No, completely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the whiskey was always without an E and then the Scottish started to make a continuously stilled whiskey, mass production, industrial production whiskey. And the Irish said, that's no longer whiskey. And then the Royal Commission decided then in those times, 1901, uh, the Irish still belonged to, to England or to Great Britain. And uh, then the Irish said, no, if you call that whiskey, then we call our whiskey whiskey. Yeah. That was the start with the E. Yeah, mm -hmm. but before it was called whiskey, it was called uskaba. Uskaba. Uski. Uski. Whiskey. Uskaba. Uski. So that's where whiskey comes from. Uskaba. Gaelic. So, cheers. Cheers. Ziemlich massiv real massive and a little not not a little some uh, citrus notes in it fruitiness a lot of smoke of course everywhere cladding my mouth and then the cask the vanilla and the maltiness adds up so the first is really big intensity and and smokiness now filling everything in, inside my mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So never have that whiskey before any of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely intense. The smokiness comes out even in, more intense in the in the flavor, where it is very f upfront, and then you do have uh, a sweetness, um, kind of like a sweetness of a of a, a smoked ham that is has a bit of sweetness in it. And a bit of these uh, these berry flavors. I'm not quite sure what they're in English called, mm. but a bit of bit of a can be compared to um, blackberries. Um, do you know what Hagebutten is in English? Mm. Um, <laughs> tough word. The fruits <laughs> of rose. Fruits of rose. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a special word in Germany for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure. Probably but it's called Hagebutt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> we have the same roots. It's n it's a German, mm -hmm. late German. Mm. 
It's a nice drum, but mm -hmm. for all of you beginners out there, but I, I don't think we have that many beginners on the channel no. today. <laughs> but for all of you beginners out there. Uh, a um, question, how many do we have on the? Uh, 130 we have on the channel. Rose hip, okay. Rose hip. Um, so for all of you beginners out there, that one might be a bit tough. So you, you for sure can add a little water with that. Don't expect the uh, the flavor to come uh, a lot, a lot, lots uh, softer or weaker. If you don't add too much, you can kill it. If you add in yeah. too much water, then you have a watery drink. But if you if you add add just enough, then uh, it's uh, it just opens up. It's wonderfully comes more intense. Oh, we have one beginner on, on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hopefully he has that whiskey in front of him. <laughs> Kraftrat Alex. He's a German Kraftrat. <laughs> and he knows what Hagebutte means. Yeah. <laughs> he looked it up. Mm. Oh, that becomes just so much more Thank smoky. You. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really smoky now, but the smokiness is not that sharp and intense. It's a a big, full, pleasant smokiness appearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, it's uh, a lot smokier, and it's it's becoming a bit one-dimensional. So I, I lost much of the sweetness now. Don't know how they did this because in the German take it was there was more sweetness in it. So yeah, the, but the smokiness is much more pleasant now. It's mm -hmm. not less smoky, but it's more mm -hmm. pleasant. Yeah. Oh, I have it sweet. Mm hmm. 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 How much smoke in ppm? I would say forty. 40, 45. I just killed it. Mine is watery. <laughs> <laughs> I just killed it. Didn't have much in the glass. If you ha don't have much in the glass, you have to be really careful. One, two drops. Not one, more. two drops is, is then enough. Yeah. So now we are heading for uh, a sequence. Sequence. Uh, so, so pr probably smelling first. Um, to have the comparison. If you do have them at home, and um, have a look how much uh, you rate them. This is smelling so much different now. Yeah, I made up my mind. I changed my mind from the German take. Mm -hmm. Not me. <laughs> I do have a pretty easy sequence. One, two, three, four. <laughs> so this time the Ochentoschen was really, really nice. Uh, then you have a really nice uh, gravy flavor with the Tullibardin. Very intense with the Buna Heaven. Today I was just not, not such into smoke. It was watery. <laughs> <laughs> so mine is different, my sequence. So the first is Buna Heaven, 12 years, because it's so intense. It's hitting your mouth so wonderfully. And uh, the second is Orantoshin, 12 years old, mm -hmm. because it's so smooth, old, triple distilled, wonderful then. Uh, the Tuli Barden, <clears throat> because it's so, uh, well, the additional cast. But it's younger, and you can feel that it's younger. And third one, or fourth one, the last, is the Lichik, because it's too smoky for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are uh, ranking from Dresden. Two, three, two, three, four, one. Mm -hmm. Una first, Lichik. Or intention than Tully. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I want to have a little announcement in the end for the next live tasting. We're gonna skip maybe January. Maybe I will do a bit of a FAQ live stream or something like that. But uh, the next official live stream, let's say it that way, will be on the 28th of February 2020, and it will be the the next step to this tasting. So it's gonna be like um, experts tasting, experts tasting, or like an advanced tasting. Advanced that's called experts. advanced or experts, and it will be the older brothers of this uh, these uh, whiskies, and we're also gonna have a new introduction of a new whiskey in this uh, live tasting, maybe if we can get it. 
Um, for all of you who can order something from Germany, inside <laughs> Germany, then you can order them at the whiskey.de shop. And yeah, so do you have something? Any questions or? Oh, oh well, we have to bring out wishes for a happy new year. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, happy new year. There will be a whiskey dot com news uh, whiskey news dot com no whiskey news <laughs> uh, um, on the end of the year about the whole year so everything put together so you if you don't watch them every week you can have the very interesting parts in one uh, part have you driven the Tesla Model Three yet yes I have one <laughs> <laughs> I do have one a long range all wheel drive okay so Mm -hmm. Date of the advanced tasting. It's going to be the 28th of February 2020 on the whiskey.com slash live. Same time, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably same time. <clears throat> Just have a look at whiskey.com slash live at some point And yeah, good. So anything yeah. else? So thank you very much for watching. Please give a thumbs up if you liked the live stream and see you next year. <laughs>